Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, I'm going to uh, kick this off, and Christine, who is joining us online, will also be with us. Um, Christine, if you want to introduce yourself, feel free. We can all hear you in the room. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for giving us some of your day to talk about sustainability and using it inside and outside the classroom. Yeah, so um, we're gonna share some resources that we have on campus to help bring sustainability into any course that you're teaching. Um, so I will get us started if I can do this. Is it just Christine online? Yes, oh no, there's other people online. Oh, oh. Christine's just presenting from online, yeah. Um, so our learning outcomes for today are to develop some ideas of how you can use our campus and data from our campus in your classroom to bring sustainability into the classroom. Um, we'll share some resources that we have um, external as well to to use some resources that um, that you might not be aware of that we have uh, partnerships with other organizations on. We'll um, talk a little bit about AI and how that might be a resource as well. And we welcome there's it's a small group online and in the classroom, so please feel free to ask questions as we go and and make it really interactive. Um, so we're going to talk about why we think teaching sustainability in any course is a good idea, what resources that we have on campus and external as well, where on campus are there good options to take students outside. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, um, well, Christine will share how she has incorporated different ideas into her classroom. Um, we'll talk about where you can get some help in bringing these ideas into the classroom and then where we all can go from here to continue to help each other through this ongoing process. So first, I'm curious um, if you all would like to share either in the chat or in the room, have you already taught sustainability in a class or is this something that's brand new or are you looking for a new way to add something you're already doing or a new way to add something new? I'm a certified green course, and so I did. I made my class take the sustainability tour last semester, but I'm a new-ish adjunct, so I'm always looking for more ideas, and I've been an environmentalist in the past for pay, and so I've done a lot of sustainability stuff, but I'm always thinking about how to Great. incorporate it into other things. Awesome. Anyone else want to share? All right. Um, why do you want to add sustainability? What brings you here today? Just learn, just learn, just learn as much as I can possibly on everything that my teaching. Great. So I'm gonna share a few facts that might help build your case for adding sustainability into your class or sharing with others. Um, uh, Inside Higher Ed poll told us that 71% of students, regardless of what they're majoring in, take a class in sustainability while they're in college. So we know our students are looking for this and probably looking not just for a general, general sustainability class, but looking for ways to connect it to their passion, to their future career interests, and looking for ways that it's really personalized to their future endeavors. In a poll that we did on campus, we know that 91% of our students strongly agree or agree that we as a society are exceeding um, environmental limits, but only half of them believe that their actions on campus matter. So we begin to see this disconnect right in our backyard. Um, the Yale Center for Climate Communications um, found that 72% of Americans believe global warming is happening, but only 36% of us even occasionally discuss it. And so there's this huge disconnect between um, what most of us are thinking about, what most of us care about and are concerned about, and how often we're talking about it and how much control we feel that we have over it. So bringing sustainability into the classroom can help meet our st students' desires to see this in their classroom and desires to connect it to things that they're interested in. We can help our students um, figure out the ways that they can connect sustainability with their future career paths. So I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't have to have a job like mine to say that you have an environmental job. Any job can be an environmental one if you're thinking about the ways that you connect to the larger world. We can empower our students to feel more in control of these huge global issues and, and their ability to influence change. Um, sustainability is just thick with systems thinking skills. And so providing students um, opportunities to grow that muscle and think about things in terms of systems is definitely a transferable skill that they could take into any job. 
Um, and we can also help them develop their resumes by giving them opportunities to learn new things and figure out what they can offer an employer as they go out into the world. Um, STARS is a huge assessment that we do every few years. We're looking to start doing it every year. Uh, it stands for the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Reporting System. It's like a giant report card for sustainability in higher education. It's tailored to universities. So um, if you're familiar with ESG reporting from companies, this is our version of it. Uh, the most unique part about it is that it includes academics. So it looks at the research and the courses that we have on campus that are connected to sustainability. Um, these are our not yet finalized scores from the survey that we filled out this year. It's in review right now. It will be public online in a couple of weeks as soon as the reviews are done. Um, but we have pretty solid scores in the academics area. Um, our biggest opportunities are really around having outcomes for majors that are specific to sustainability. But in terms of course offerings, we only have a handful of departments that don't offer at least one class in sustainability. So our students um, have a lot of opportunity to connect sustainability to different things. And we just want to provide to make sure that all students have that opportunity, regardless of what they're majoring in and as they explore different interests. So some resources that we have on campus, you mentioned taking a tour with our office. So our office offers sustainability tours on campus um, and our friends in the Arboretum also offer Arboretum tours. Um, they overlap a little, but they are both tailorable to whatever the class is. I have had a lot of professors who reach out and say, you know, this is what our class is talking about during this part of the semester. When you go on the tour, could you focus a little bit more on that? And we're always happy to do that. The same is true for guest lectures. When we come into a class and talk about campus sustainability, we're always happy to adjust and make sure that whatever we're talking about fits into your curriculum and is meeting the needs of the students. So it's not just a generic presentation that um, students might see the same version of again and again if professors keep inviting us. We really make sure that if we see the same student in a class, they're learning something new the next time that they meet us. We'll also do longer term things. Um, if professors reach out to us in advance of a course, we're usually happy to do projects with groups of students that might last several weeks or over the course of a semester. Um, we do appreciate advance notice for that one since it does take a lot of time. And we've worked on independent studies as well to give students really an opportunity to deep dive into something that we're doing on campus, figure out how they can leave their fingerprint on it and make it better for us. Um, I know Christine has worked on those with waste. Um, we've also done them um, with students in the past, helping us with offset projects that we use for carbon neutrality. We've had students who have worked with our office to help external partners as well. Um, several years back, we had two students who did an independent study through my office who helped the British Embassy come up with their plan to eliminate single use plastics on their campus. So um, we try to find really great opportunities to help students really get some great experience through these independent study projects with partnership with external offices, offices on campus, and then our office as well. Um, so those are some of the like hands on things that we offer in our office, but we also have a whole lot of data that we can provide to students who are interested in deep diving into some really specific information about what's happening on our campus. So I mentioned stars stars um, is used by hundreds of universities and their website allows for you to compare university to university to get a big picture of what trends there might be in a certain area. And the STARS questions range from academics like we looked at to our operations on campus, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, energy use, to um, the social aspects of sustainability, of sustainability, our inclusivity and diversity programs. Um, it looks at pay equity, a, a whole host of things. Um, and then there are also the financial elements of sustainability are captured there with investing um, and with governance of the university in general and how that tail how that fits into sustainability goals. So you can look into our past reports and compare how AU has done over time, or you can compare broadly across types of universities, regional uh, universities, and really get a sense of the bigger picture of sustainability um, in higher education. I'm gonna unshare this for a second. 
and take you on a little tour of our website to give you some of these other things. Um, so this is our sustainability website. We have recently added this academics page. Um, this will give you a bigger picture of all the different um, course offerings that we have way down at the bottom. Um, we have our sustainability courses and research lists. These are all of the courses that we know of that include sustainability on campus um, and all of the research that we know that's being conducted on campus that's related to sustainability. Um, we have a sustainability fund. So if there's something you're working on in your class that you think has the ability to have some legs and live longer on campus and you need some funding for it, we have small uh, <laughs> amounts of money available. Um, and then we have this sustainability across the curriculum page, which is a resource for faculty who want to dive into a lot of these things that we're talking about today. So how to get in touch with us for a tour um, and a whole bunch of other things that we have on campus, which include our lead case studies. So we have um, case studies for every green building on campus. This is an example of the Hall of Science case study. It explains all of the features in the building that make it a green building. Um, we've had students who are in a lot of different classes who will use this as a resource to learn more and figure out what we could do to take it to the next level. Um, SIMAP is where all of our greenhouse gas emission, emissions data lives. So students can look at data going all the way back to 2005 for all of the different sources of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we like raw data is available here too, or you can look at trends through all of the different charts that they have. And then we also have uh, real time data available for energy and water use in most of our buildings on campus. This is Hall of Science. Um, this is the amount of cooling that has been needed for this building um, up to today. So it's real time. This shows it by month, but we also have the ability to um, to drill down to 15 minute increments if students want to look at like impacts over the course of a day or do an experiment to see, well, this changed, how did energy use in that building change from day one to day two? So there is a ton of data that we have available on our website and we can tailor all of this too. So if a class reaches out and says, we're really interested in this building compared to that building, we can build one of these dashboards that will share that information with those students and they'll be able to access it and look at the real-time data as well. It's very easy to build a dashboard. It's not, it's not a huge lift for us. Switch back. Um, finally, we also have data on our engagement. So if students are interested in learning about outreach and talking about like the psychology behind how we're reaching students and what methods we're using, we have all of the information about who we've reached and, and the programs that we've used in the past. And we've worked with psychology classes in the past to figure out better ways to reach students. And that's always been a lot of fun. Um, so I mentioned the research and course lists that we have. That's also a great tool if you're thinking about bringing sustainability in in a way that you might not have expertise in. You can always look through those lists and say, oh, like this is exactly what I would like our students to talk about that day. Maybe I can invite that person to come for a guest lecture. Um, or ask them for some recommendations for a course reading. CTRL's green teaching program that you mentioned is really about how, how we teach. And uh, I consider these resources more like what we teach, but linking them together kind of helps show our students that we're committed across the board, that it's not just one or the other, that we're thinking about it when we're preparing what our course lo looks like in addition to what is included in our course. All of the previous sustainability workshops from um, the CTRL workshops are also available online. They all cover a whole host of, of um, related but different topics. And then we've recently started our ongoing conversation series. The next one will be in early October. And that's an opportunity for faculty to informally gather, share questions about adding sustainability, share successes, um, and just talk with each other about what's going well in our classes. We also have a lesson plan available on our website that can be tailored to any class that you might be um, working on. For external resources, um, ACHI is the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. Um, there are a number of webinars that are available to anybody in our community who creates an account. 
And there's also a hub within HE where we can upload resources that we've created. So faculty from all from universities around the country that are HE members who have created a class that includes sustainability um, have uploaded case studies. So there's a lot of information there that is faculty specific. It's not just for creating you know, energy reduction programs. There are a lot of uh, things on the HE website hub that are specific to faculty and teaching sustainability. USGBC is the um, US Green Building Council. It's the organization behind LEED, the um, checklist essentially for creating a green building. We have a university subscription, so our entire community has unlimited access to their educational platform. You can use it to maintain LEED credentials, but it also has a whole set of badges and certificates that can be earned by anyone in our community. One example is the Certified Green Classroom Professional Certificate. It's a three hour online class, then you take a uh, quiz at the end, and then you become a certified green classroom professional. And so it's an opportunity to learn um, what as a K through 12 teacher, you might be interested in adopting in your classroom and not just how you'll introduce it to your students, but what in the physical classroom you might wanna be paying attention to, to make sure that it's a healthy space for children and you and make sure that you know, you're not blocking vents that might be needed for um, ventilation in the classroom. Just general awareness about things that are specific to classroom sustainability. And there are a number of other certifications and badges that are related to other aspects of sustainability through that program. Um, and Christine mentioned in the chat that uh, USGBC is conveniently located in DC and they do have a lot of internships available as well. Um, Christine has had students, I've had students who have um, interned there and Christine has had people from USGBC come and visit classes. Um, it's very convenient that they're right down the street. <laughs> Um, so we talked about the website and where to find everything. And then on our campus itself, um, another way to introduce sustainability into classrooms is to use it as a way to get students outside, think about how we can use nature to our benefit. Um, I know you're an expert <laughs> in this area, um, but there's a lot of opportunities to get students outside, use the campus to help them reduce their stress. Um, we have a few locations listed here. This is the labyrinth outside of K Spiritual Center that's pictured. Um, the amphitheater, the SIS Herb Garden is located on the Nebraska side of SIS, um, like kind of around the front. It's never crowded when I'm there and it's a lovely little spot with edible plants. Um, the quadruplex over by McCabe has a wonderful green yard area. Uh, it's also where you can find our upcycled hot tub that is a water barrel. Um, so fun little scavenger hunt activity for students over there. Uh, the Unity Garden, the gardens over by Watkins and Krieger. I mean, this list could go on and on all day. We have so many locations on campus. Um, one activity that I have used and that I recommend giving a try to is having students sit in one of these locations, put their cell phones down, observe it for just five minutes. You might consider giving them an index card that they could draw a picture on. Uh, um, about what they're seeing and what they're looking at. You could provide them questions that they might wanna consider. When I've sent students out, I've had them reflect on how the built environment and the natural environment are either competing or cooperating with one another. Um, one thing that I found really fascinating about this activity is the insight you get into the way your students are thinking about the world by what they draw. And I've seen a, a big difference um, in, in the way students think about course material based on what they're drawing. And so I would say if I divided them into two buckets, there's a group of us who would draw the whole picture, like a building that we see along with the trees and the plants, somebody walking down a sidewalk and somebody else who will draw one leaf. Like this is what I am looking at right now. And it's just a fascinating like little peek into the way that their mind works. And if you just ask a really vague question, how do they interpret that and what are they looking at? And obviously there's not a right or a wrong way to draw a picture of this and what you're thinking about. Um, but it's, um, but then I followed it up with in, in class discussions. So students share what they drew a picture of, what they thought about, what they saw that was conflicting, um, what they saw that was cooperating in terms of the built and the natural environments. And, you can really tailor that question, what you want them to observe based on whatever it is that you're teaching. Anyone have any questions or thoughts at this point? Okay. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Christine. Okay, thanks, Megan. And while um, I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce myself and my journey just a little bit, because uh, my journey also started at AU as an adjunct, um, coming in teaching uh, sustainability. So welcome to, to any new faculty that's joining AU and, and, and interested in teaching sustainability, because that's what grabbed that's what brought me to AU, um, having a career in the private sector with corporate social responsibility and ESG, um, and also working in the um, campaign and advocacy space of environmental uh, science and sustainability initiatives uh, with uh, Pew Charitable Trust um, based in DC. So all that said, I just wanted to say that I, I really drew from my experience on the outside to bring it into the classroom. Um, and one of the class, um, classes that I teach is called Food for Thought. Um, and this is a complex problems class. Um, it, it was born out of the work that the recipes group is doing at American University, which is a five year, $15 million grant looking at food waste um, along the uh, supply chain. Um, and what we have looked at inside the class um, is not only you know, to describe how and where food is wasted, but to talk about the different food systems and explain how different communities um, experience And so what I do is, oh, Christine, you in this class, um, again, most of them. Christine, you froze for a second. Could you just repeat your last thought? Yep. Thank you. Um, oh, goodness. Is my internet unstable? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. You know, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to turn off my video and see if that helps. Um. So, so there's no interruption. So the class um, that I teach on food waste, it's been taught now for, this will be the third consecutive semester. Um, and again, most of the students are incoming freshmen. And so it's a great way to get students outside the classroom and get, introduce them to some of the sustainability initiatives that are happening around campus. Um, and contribute to the metrics that Megan was talking about. So one example, um, the community garden, which is actually where a newly LEED certified building will be going um, and is currently um, moved, but uh, we would bring students to the community garden and we would see where some of the crops from the garden would make its way into the enhanced market uh, pantry, which you see here in the middle. This is a, a food pantry um, that's right in Mary Graydon Center and gives access to students um, to, to get food. Um, and so when we talk about wasted food, uh, we're also looking at ways to divert that um, into um, you know, edible food, not just composting um, food that has partially been uneaten or unused, but also diverting any potential waste to those that uh, can use it and need it, including right here on our campus. What those tours have resulted in is students volunteering, for example, um, at the food pantry um, and where their needs are, um, you know, composting crew, for example, as well. Um, and all this kind of ties in nicely um, to the work that the zero waste um, management group is doing on campus. And we, you know, we take uh, tours, guided tours by the zero waste manager, um, Carolyn um, Boone, who gives an outstanding uh, tour, as does the, um, the director of the food market pantry. So again, this isn't just us going in and navigating it alone. These are guided tours. Um, and what that leaves students thinking is how they can reduce their own waste, right? And that's kind of the goal of the course um, is to, to self-reflect, educate, and then um, advocate to reduce wasted food. So for example, the, the course in the fall ties in nicely with Thanksgiving, that's right before they do some of their research. And a lot of times students will realize there are many ways to repurpose your leftovers. 
Um, and so that is really taking what we're studying inside the classroom, outside, on the AU campus, introducing incoming students to what sustainability initiatives are happening on campus. Then another um, uh, class um, that I teach, and I'm just giving you examples, um, samples from some of the classes that I teach here. Um, and this class is energy and pollution. Um, it's a 200 uh, level class um, and it's part of the um, environmental science. And here we're looking at um, environmental issues um, resulting from fossil fuel extraction and use, um, but then also looking at uh, renewable energy. And what I notice a lot of times with incoming, with students that take this course is because we start off and talk about fossil fuels and the, and, and the impacts of those students, there tends to be some anxiety in the classroom, we'll call it eco anxiety or, um, or, or fear uh, kind of, of, you know, because this material is rather, you know, heavy, uh, you know, we find a way, I, I try and look for ways that the students can be a little bit more hopeful because we also discuss renewable energies. So one thing I've done inside the classroom um, is I brought a professional dancer in and um, Jamie Host, um, Klinger Host, is a professional dancer um, and she is a, a ballet dancer, um, but she's also taught climate change um, uh, through dance and teaching um, that inside the classroom. And so I invited Jamie to come to this class and I was a little bit nervous because I thought, well, I don't know how everyone's gonna respond to, you know, enacting, um, you know, what a, what a, you know, a, a, a wind farm would look like to the tune of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. But I was so pleasantly surprised to see, and Jamie's a professional and she knows how to bring the students um, into poses and movements that convey positive energy about um, you know, renewable sources of energy. And it was the first time I did it. Um, and I have to say that I, I, was, I was pretty pleased. Um, I didn't take any pictures of, you, here you just see a picture of Jamie at the front of the class getting the students ready, but I didn't take any pictures of the students because I wanted to respect their privacy and allow them to really lean in to this um, art and movement. Uh, so to speak. So those would be two examples um, of ways that I've uh, brought, uh, you know, perhaps an unconventional, untraditional way um, to deal with um, environmental issues and eco anxiety through movement and dance inside the classroom. So and some other forms of untraditional and unconventional um, ways to bring in sustainability um, is something that Megan and I have talked about is exploring AI. Yes, so um, earlier this summer, I was talking to some faculty who use AI all the time, and I had to confess that I had never touched it and was left, left with the challenge to give it a try. Um, I would say I have hesitancies around it for a lot of reasons, uh, only one of which being the vast amount of energy that it consumes. But knowing that our students use it and that here it is, um, I figured it was worth exploring and <laughs> seeing what we could benefit from. So um, as a complete novice to the world of ChatGPT, I leaned on uh, Leah, who works in my office, who has embraced it to help me with this. And we crafted a question. Uh, Early Christian and Byzantine art, art is a class that I took uh, to fulfill a requirement when I was in college. I majored in accounting, so it was not an accounting class, but I was pleasantly surprised by how fascinating I found it. And as I was like, well, what's a class that I took once that I would think would be hard to connect to sustainability? Um, I landed on early Christian and Byzantine art. And so we crafted this question to just ask ChatGPT to um, explore ways that sustainability could be brought into the classroom for this particular course, and then asked it specifically to provide 10 examples. Um, to share how sustainability um, could be introduced in a university class for early Christian and Byzantine art. And ChatGPT went to work and came up with what I thought were some pretty good suggestions about looking at materials that are used in that art, the culture around um, the, the art and why and when it was created, 
um, tourism that now goes into looking at those locations where this art lives, the production um, and ecological impact of extracting those materials at the time or today, um, religious narratives that went into it, stewardship that comes from the philosophical side and the religious side, um, and then connecting it interdisciplinary. It's not just about art, but how this fits into society and what science was doing at the time. So um, I think this was a useful way to get my mind turning about if I were teaching early Christian and Byzantine art today, what are some things that would make sense in my curriculum to bring that in? Um, and it was a nice way to kind of dip my toe into the water that is AI and, and explore it. Uh, I don't know if I'm in the vast, like the small minority now that is still not really using ChatGPT, um, or have you used it? You have. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was really helpful in figuring out new ways that I might want to include something, but really make it tie into something that is seemingly unrelated to traditional sustainability topics. So I really um, encourage you to think outside the box and figure out how could I bring this into a class that students might not be expected expecting to see sustainability. But as Christine mentioned, um, there is a lot of eco anxiety around a lot of these topics. And the more we talk about it, the more we acknowledge kind of this elephant that's in the room and in the back of their heads all the time, the more we can empower them to figure out how they can influence change, that they aren't alone in thinking about these things, that the rest of us are aware and thinking about it too. Um, I think that as I've dug into eco-anxiety, it causes how Gen Z is thinking about it, that isolation that they feel from not talking about it is really palpable. And so the more we can bring it into classrooms, even if it's just tangentially related to what we're doing, the more that we can help them to recognize that it's it's not just them realizing it. We're we're all in that boat together, even if we're not Gen Z. <laughs> um, yeah, any questions, thoughts? About which part? Any part, yes. <laughs> um, thank you, Christine, for talking about the garden. Uh, quick question, where's the garden going now that the- It's located, are... it's already built, and it's located behind Katzen, like in between Katzen and Nebraska. So if you walk around, um, this is the new one. The new one. Cool. Yeah, and it, it is beautiful. Okay, great. Yeah. So the big question is, I didn't see on stars or whatever the other trackings are, uh, food consumption on campus. Mm. I turned vegetarian on campus 30 years ago. We're using Thanksgiving food waste this is very 90s ish. So like, where's the sort of updated like food consumption metrics? Stars. Yeah, it is okay, in great. stars. Stars has more than 600 data points. So we really just scraped the surface of yeah. what is in stars today. Um, and so there is a whole section on dining and food and it is split into our spend. So what types of things are we spending like the dining budget on and then also on food recovery. And so food recovery is divided into a few different categories. Um, compost being one of them, food pantry being another but also general food waste reduction that's happening behind the scenes in the dining hall, like the technology that they're using to make sure that they're buying exactly what they need for that week's worth of meals and, and not over purchasing, creating food waste unnecessarily. Obviously there's multiple benefits to them for that, producing food waste being one, but not spending money unnecessarily is another. Um, right. Yeah, so it, it looks at all of that. So for students who want to know, because food is such a huge, uh, in contributor to climate change as well yeah. as a factor that will influence students' lives, but it certainly has mine for the rest of their lives. Where would a student go on campus to learn about the rape of the oceans, the in, in the efficiency of growing meat for the whole world the way we do cultivated meat? Like, where does that food come up? Is that in specific classes? Is it a club? Is it a sustainability office? Um, it would primarily be clubs, I think is where I've seen it, clubs and classrooms. Um, so there are definitely classes certainly related to recipes that touch on that, um, that material. We don't have anything through our office right now. I think that there are, so the, the world of, of higher ed greenhouse gas emissions inventories is starting to shift. 
Um, we have followed a protocol that has not included dining, mostly because of the difficulty in tracking it and it not being kind of universally available. Um, but that door is opening to figure out how we can do a better job of capturing more things in our greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Thankfully, even though it's not in the inventory, it is in stars in a meaningful way. So we're still capturing it, we're still tracking it, we're still working on improving it. But um, I think that there is like, I would welcome a class wanting to deep dive into those scope three emissions that we're not looking at yet and figuring out what would be the benefit of including them, how can we do a better job of including them. The way we would include them now is just by dollars, um, which is also like a little tricky, like what your food spend is on certain things. So it's not really down to that minutia that you're talking about, like looking at, well, okay, we're spending money on fish, but what fish are we spending that money on? Are we thinking about, um, you know, lists of fish that we should be avoiding through Montgomery or Monterey Bay Aquariums list or something like that? And so um, I, I think there's a really interesting student project that's that's sitting there and that is really timely for how we're beginning to change how we think about our greenhouse gas, gas emissions at AU, but in higher ed in general. It's not about food, uh, but about beekeeping. I used to work for a beekeeping company. I know you have beehives on campus. I've met Chris that runs it. He's the pesticide guy. Um, <laughs> bees are not sustainable in any way. The honeybee population, happy to go on a rant about it, but uh, we shouldn't be spending university dollars on that. The students aren't even around in summer when the bees are actually kept. The beekeeping club doesn't learn anything much about beekeeping and they should be supporting native bees. Anyway, I just don't know how you evaluate things in the Office of Sustainability to spend money on. But like, for example, that shouldn't be one of them. Yeah, um, it's student, it's all student driven, like the student club has existed for a long time. And I think that's, that's where it is. Um, I don't know where they get their funds. They don't get it from my office. Um, we've paid for some of them to go to beekeeping classes in the past so that they are learning more and bringing that back to campus. Um, I'm not sure if they're still doing that though. I haven't worked with yeah, them. Yeah, there's a contractor who's paid who comes in and takes care yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's on your website, so I thought it was part of your program. Um, oh, it's on the Arboretum oh, website. Sorry. Oh, 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 oh that, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're connected to them. They just don't, if we just don't manage it directly. Okay. Yeah, Chris does. <laughs> yeah, and so anyway, I don't know, aside from me, like, going to the beekeeping club and being like, you guys are deluded, you know, which I can do as an educational thing, um, but like that's not something that students should be encouraged as like an environmentally friendly thing to do at this point. Yeah, like, knowing what we know in twenty twenty four. Yeah, I think that there are. Um, it's not both and, right? Like we are supporting native bees. We have a lot of native plants that are on campus, um, and I've been talking to the arboretum about increasing signage specifically around natives and they're updating their signage. And so now our plants on campus that are native will say that in the new signage that's coming. Um, it's just, yeah. How can the native bees by having like a million yeah. honeybees if they're invasive species from here? Anyway, I don't need to go on and on about it, but I just thought that maybe your office was supporting it and that was like going through some screen and I was like, hey, update the screen. This <laughs> is not a good choice. Yeah, it is. Um, and that's like sustainable campuses are not going to be touched right now. It is, it is not through my office, but yeah. we, can, we can talk. <laughs> okay, totally different thing. Yeah, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> For now. <laughs> I have lots of ideas, so I'm not gonna I would, I would love to chat more. <laughs> um, let's see. Somebody wanted to. Oh, um, let me read the chat. Oh, Christine teaches sustainable seafood. Um, in the spring semester and so you if you have questions related to seafood she is covering it in a, in a class great yeah it's okay we're on at american.edu um christine could you drop your email in the chat just so i don't get it wrong you got it <laughs> thank you <laughs> um any other thoughts questions ideas great the sustainability is, tour is great. Take your students on the sustainability tour. We have a lot of fun with it, and um, and really, we're very happy to to tailor it to whatever the needs of that class are. I have more fun when I get to tailor it. I've been here for ten years. I've given that tour a lot. So <laughs> when people ask me to deep dive into one thing, it's a, it's a lot more fun. Um, yeah, and I took a. I'm sorry to jump in, but I took a full moon arboretum tour, and that was that was great. Yeah. 
Mike um, in the Arboretum has yep. been here for more than 25 years. Uh, he has been integral to the development of the Arboretum and his wealth of not just plant knowledge, but the history of the university knowledge is really fascinating. And I think he does the full moon tours. Is that right? Yes, it was through Mike. And um, yeah, I would encourage, uh, I, I don't know how I found out about it actually, but it, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's been around for a few years now. It's a pretty cool, yeah. it, her email is just Baran. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. It was nice to meet you all. Please stay in touch. We're very happy to help in any way we can. These are just the generic resources, but we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one support too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Christine. Thank you all and um, reach out if you have any questions about these classes, happy to share or, or co-coordinate tours. Yeah, and Christine, you are normally on campus. You're just remote. Yes, the greetings. Day. Yeah, greetings from the Salish Sea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrapping up a couple family related things before coming back. So thanks again. Thanks, Megan. Thanks all. <laughs>